My name is Lee Fanwick. I'm here to interview Jack Stiasny for the Stanford Jewish Historical Society. Today is January 14th, 2011. Jack, I want to thank you for allowing us to come in to interview you because I'm sure you have some very interesting things to tell us. Tell me, Jack, uh, where were your parents born? Well, my mother was born in Poland in a little town called Zawyszczyk. My father was born in Vienna. They met in Vienna. My grandparents emigrated from their town during the First World War went to Vienna, and my mother worked there and created friends. Anyway, she met my father. I think she was introduced or made at a party, I'm not sure. Did they get married in Vienna? No, they got married in New York. Um, no, I, they came, I reckon they came in 20, 1920. I was born in 22. Were you born in, where were you born? I was born on the Lower East Side. When, they, when I was born, my parents lived on Ludlow Street. <coughs> on the Lower East Side, and I was born at uh, St. Mark's Hospital, which doesn't exist anymore. It's been turned out. And uh, I don't have any sisters or brothers, just me. Where was, uh, where, what brought, what, were, what business was your father and what did my he father, do? My father was in the electrical contracting business. Uh, he worked, uh, I know that he worked for a company when I was born because I had photographs that he showed me and I, I've given him, I've given him to others. Uh, and then, uh, uh, and then he ultimately went into business so that as far as I remember, right, he always had his little company, and it was located down in the garment center in New York. He had a shop, and uh, he employed some people when he needed them. And uh, anyway, I've answered your question, but it go, I can go on and on because that's uh, it was important to me that <clears throat> in all of my formative life. Um, I work with my father, and I always said, uh, and I still say, that I started working for him when I was eight years old. <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> what, well, what were you, you know, like his he, assistant? He, he had he had work with uh, manufacturers in the garment business. That's when, you know, the garment center in New York was yes. a manufacturing uh, haven. And he did a lot of alterations for these people and new installations and so forth. Somehow or other, he, he had the contacts, or however that happened. But, and, and in those days, uh, you know, lighting, let's say, I, what I did was uh, I put uh, wires around the uh, sockets, okay? In those days, uh, you didn't have lighting, you didn't have fluorescent fixtures. They came, uh, you know, a few years later. but. They had, all the lights were big dome lights and reflectors with a lamp, but it had a socket and a, and a cord. And my father would bring the stuff home. And after dinner, he would prepare for the next day's work. And I'd be sitting under the table, he'd feed me <laughs> the wire and the sockets and I'd put it around and then he'd check me out. So I always say that I started when I was eight years old. I don't recall, I probably was 12, 13, you know, I got, out, I got into my teens, let's say, when every, every holiday, every day off, I went to work for my father. Uh, and so, but we also had great times so during that time. But anyway, so I've been at this virtually all my life, and I always knew where I was going. I always knew that I would be involved in the same kind of business. And, you know, did you have a Jew Pardon. Did you have a Jewish upbringing, Jack? Say again. Did you have a Jewish upbringing? Did you have a Jewish upbringing? Yeah, I have a Jewish up. Absolutely, absolutely. My. See, I, I never knew my father's family, except for 
one of his aunts, my great aunt, his mother's sister, who lived in Plattsburgh, New York, uh, whom we, we visited quite often uh, during the summertime. But uh, my mother's parents were traditional Orthodox Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And uh, with all of the all of the customs, okay, all, the, all of the customs, all the holidays, including, <laughs> including running a chicken around the head, <laughs> all of that. I remember that so well. Yeah. And uh, anyway, uh, we didn't. Do you remember it wasn't the, holidays. Wasn't like you think about it today. Yeah. I mean, I don't remember that Pesach. We had a, 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 my my grandfather, of course, would would the host, um, um, I'm sorry, Seder. And then when he passed on, my mother's brothers, of which there were four that came. Anyway, one of them at least uh, would have a Seder, and I made it my business to go there sometimes. I don't remember my parents that were necessarily going. Do then I began to do my own Seder, so. Right. Uh, do you remember? Do you remember what synagogue you went to down the well, Lower East we Side? Didn't, we didn't. No, you don't. We didn't go to synagogue. Uh, what's, what, what kind of a, what was your schooling? My schooling? Yeah. Well, I, I, I graduated from Stuyvesant High School in uh, Manhattan in 39. <laughs> and then uh, I went from there to NYU College of Engineering. And I got a degree in electrical engineering from the College of Engineering at NYU. Um, unfortunately, between my junior and senior year, 41, the war started. At least uh, the Nazis invaded Poland, and one thing led to another. I remember those very vividly. And, uh, uh, and in, in any event, uh, so then I went, I was in the service, and I was there until about uh, almost uh, 47, into 47. And when I came back, because we got about a $3,000 some odd GI Bill thing, I uh, enrolled in the uh, Graduate School of Business Administration at NYU. I took all of the curriculum. I, I was a average student, but I never got a degree because I needed to do a, a thesis, and I didn't, uh, I didn't finish doing that. Later on, uh, it turns out you could take an exam. If I could take an exam, I would have done that without any difficulty. But, uh, so, you know, that's the extent of my... Where did you meet, where did you meet Ruth? That's a, Sorry, <laughs> I met Ruth at Madison Square Garden, the old Madison Square Garden on 53rd Street, where on Sunday nights they had singles ice skating sessions, and um, one, of, one of my friends, uh, Saul Greenberg, uh, rest his soul, uh, <clears throat> and I would uh, skate. And now you have to understand. I didn't do any of that until I came back from the service. I mean, I didn't grow up that way. We, I was not exposed to any of that. So I did that all on my own, okay? Went out and got skates, and, and I skated in Rockefeller Plaza and different places. I mean, you also have to understand, you just don't get on the ice and skate. You know, it takes a little bit of time. But here we are, this Sunday night, it, uh, at uh, Madison Square Garden, we had been skating around, as, as did a lot of other people. And then we got off the ice and we were standing at what they call at the boards. And uh, <clears throat> we're chatting, and these two young ladies come up to the boards, you know, would you like to skate with us? My wife, Ruthie said that. So I said to her, <clears throat> When you ask me that way, how can I refuse? And off we went. So uh, she always said that she never expected that I would call her. But uh, I, you know, 
know, I, she worked as a nurse uh, downtown, and I got her telephone number, and I called her, and we met in May, and we were got married in December, and uh, another, I mean, it's, the story goes on and on because we we had some we had some great times, weekends and whatever. I lived in the Bronx, way up in the Bronx, and she lived in Long Beach, Long Island. And I would drive her home, and then I would come home, it would be in the, maybe in the wee hours in the morning. Uh, then uh, one of my classmates, who ultimately became my best man, Howard Merkin, um, that's an interesting story because Howard, lived on the same street that I lived on, that my family lived on, after we moved, made a move to Stebbins Avenue. Anyway, his father was a physician on the street and everybody knew him. But I never, I didn't, we were not, it wasn't like here, we, we didn't have buddies and it wasn't, it wasn't like that. But uh, he, he ended up at NYU and in and, and the Arts College and, and we got to know each other. And so anyway, we rented a place in, in um, Atlantic Beach for the summer. And uh, that was four miles away from where Ruthie lived. <laughs> so we were pretty, that was pretty close. Yeah, right. And uh, I would commute. And he, he at that time was a professor at uh, Fairleigh Dickinson and uh, he commuted sometimes and one thing or another. We came out every weekend. Our mothers, respected mothers, gave us all kinds of food to bring out. I can go on and on. I mean, that's all. I can tell you a lot of details about it. Did Ruth, did Ruth a, ever talk about the, I knew she came from Nova Scotia. Ruth was born in Kentville, Nova Scotia. Did yeah. she ever talk about uh, Nova Scotia? What kind of, were there a lot of Jews up there? There were Jewish people. Of course there are. She had. Did she ever talk about it? Of course. She, you, you want me to just give you a synopsis? Of, well, I'm, uh, I don't think of Jews living in Nova Scotia. Oh, a lot of Jews living in Nova Scotia. You go to Halifax, there are two synagogues. One is an Orthodox synagogue, one is a, is a uh, conservative synagogue. I don't, know, I don't know what the population is particularly, but uh, we've been to both. And uh, there's a Jewish cemetery. Our parents are buried there. Mm -hmm. We visited there every time we went. Right. Uh, uh, no, sure she did. She talked uh, glowingly, really, about uh, her father. You know, they lived in Kentville. It was a small town. Mm -hmm. They were the only, essentially, the only Jews. I'm saying that because I think there was one other Jewish family, but I don't know. They were not involved, but. Her father had a, a general store, okay? So mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff to the farmers and whatever. But when Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur came, he closed the store and they all got in the car and at least one car, because she was one of 12. Mm -hmm. now, by the time she was born, you know, earlier ones had already married or had left. Some came to the United States but uh, I don't know how many children she never, I can't remember it particularly, uh, how many other siblings were with them, but they got in the car, her mother fixed a picnic lunch halfway to Nova Scotia, and halfway to Halifax, uh, and, and parenthetically, they had prearranged, and this went on every year, with a family that rented out space so that they could stay overnight. And <laughs> She spoke about that. Mm -hmm. What year did you come to Stanford? When did we? What year did you come? When did you come to 1953. Stanford? 1953. We uh, we were married in '51. When we were married, we lived in an apartment uh, uh, in Jackson Heights, and uh, wasn't very long after that we began to. We knew that we were going to want to live in a house somewhere. Her sisters 
lived in New Jersey. They wanted her to come to New Jersey. She didn't want to do that. Not that she didn't get along. We all got along very well. But she didn't want any part of that, particularly. So we looked around in Long Island and Westchester and then ultimately uh, in, in Connecticut. Um, every uh, Thursday, the papers, the New York Times would come out. Uh, we'd get the supplemental section on real estate. We'd look and see what was available. And uh, we spent about a year um, looking and then ultimately we came to Stanford. We went out with a lot of real estate people, Silverman, a lot of people. I, I don't know if it's appropriate to say this in this kind of an interview, but I just couldn't countenance real estate people. So it ended up on our own. There were five houses that we liked. And we said, Oh, we can't get one, we'll take two, three, four. Well, this was number one. Uh, people who lived here from whom we bought the house were transferred to St. Louis, became available, we bought the house. And uh, I, just because today this house, I don't know what's valued, but it's valued at several hundred thousand dollars. We bought this house for $23,500. <laughs> What, uh, were you working for a company when you came to Stanford? Uh, when I came to Stanford, I was working for a company. When I was married, <clears throat> let me back up a minute. I told you that I worked for my father for, right. uh, on and off for some years, whatever. But we always went on vacation. We always had, we went through the Depression. I always said, I, you know, we always had food on the table. My uncles were not like that. My uncles were poor. I know that, okay? That was at that time, okay? They were in the fur business, things went down the tubes. I think they lost a lot of money in investments. I used to hear them grumbling about that. I didn't understand it. Now I understand a little bit when I reflect back. But in any event, um, so then the war came, and then when I came back from the service, I went and worked back to work with my dad, okay? Now, you know, he was, we did electrical work, okay? It wasn't beyond me particularly, but it was certainly not enough for me. And I was anxious to get out and see what the rest of the world was. So I applied uh, with, uh, Electrical Engineering Association had a personnel department, and they sent me a couple of leads. Long story short, I went to work. Now, I, I always say I think I broke my father's heart. But, you know, uh, it wasn't too long. I was with this particular company for four and a half years, and I was the only one, essentially the only one there. And, um, when I used to come home and tell my dad what I was involved in, I think he was pretty proud of that. But anyway, so then from there, I, you know, I made, a, I left there without going in, and I went to another company for a short time, and then I went with John Doris Incorporated. I was there for twenty-eight years. Um, Were they in Stanford? Pardon? No, they... no, all in New York. All, New All in New York. No, I, I commuted. I commuted by train, but you know, in, 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 when you're in the construction business, your work is all over the place. So if I had to go to Brooklyn, I had to go to Queens, I would drive. And, but I commuted quite a bit by train. We had an office uh, in the Lincoln Building and didn't have to get wet. Anyway, I, I could go on and on. A lot of this. When you came here, uh, you joined the Good of Shalom? Um, I found my way to Grove Street. I remember very well. It wasn't the first time, but I remember very well having a big discussion with Walter. That's the issue. I came, we came in 53, and I found my way to Good of Shalom. 
And at that time, uh, Rabbi Erkrenz was in his prime. Um, I call it that, anyway. Or he, maybe he was growing up. Or he was whatever. just a young man. He was still a young man. But he created the Couples Club. And uh, you know, we used to call it. Uh, That's where we made all, of, Yeshiva, made all of our had, friends there. Pardon? That's where you met uh, all your colleagues, friends, whatever. I had a lot of, had a lot of laughs, a lot of good times, and um, I mentioned Walter because one day I'm in Shul. Walter Shakatavitz. Yeah, Walter Shakatavitz. I'm sitting, if you remember, the old Grove Street Synagogue. Yes, I do. The, the pews were faced, except that on the sides there were few, there were pews that faced the, the. Uh, our codage from from the side, and I my I had a seat in the back row of those. There were maybe five or six rows, and there's a guy in front of me, and he didn't stop talking, <laughs> talking to whoever he was talking. I don't remember, but what I do remember is hearing that he said he was going to start a school, and it was going to be the greatest school, and so forth and so on. And that was Walter, and I've reminded him of that. And then um, I had a big discussion with him uh, outside the front door of the synagogue one time when uh, I don't remember what agitated me, but I said to him, nothing's going to keep me through those doors. You know, I don't come to hear the rabbi, I don't come to hear whatever. I come for my purpose. And, uh, but, uh, you know, we, to this day, we're good acquaintances. I can't say we're friends, we don't buddy-buddy or anything, but I, I opposed the creation of, I, I, no, I didn't oppose the creation of the day school. What I did was, uh, I, I was an opponent along with, uh, I forgot his first name, Backer at the time. Eddie Backer? Eddie, well. I don't know, it's his father. Eddie is his son? Yeah. No, Eddie's father, okay? Uh, I remember. It's okay. <laughs> I, uh, that, that they were using the facilities of Agata Shalom, we were paying for it, and they weren't contributing anything. And that bugged me as it did him. And, you know, but. It was always the children, the children, the children. Fine, that's okay. It's, that's the way life is, and right. I've overcome all of that, uh, of course. And they've shown, uh, without a regard, without any regard, the fact that uh, they run a, a wonderful school and that put out some pretty, uh, pretty important people. They've, Did they've, your children go to bicultural day school? Say again? Did your children? No, no, I didn't do that. I didn't. No, my children went to the Hebrew school and I got a show. Them. And they got a good education. I don't know. They know they're Jewish. That's right. They, they do. Uh, they do uh, observe uh, in their own way, and I have no argument about that. You were active in the Jewish Center, and you became president. Well, I, you know, that was another uh, interesting background thing. Our neighbors across the street, you know, Mary Weber, do you know yes. that name? Yes, okay. I do. She was Winnick when we first moved here. They had a baby furniture store down on Prospect Street, right? She and Jack Winnick operated that, and they were avid sailors. And one day, uh, he came back from one of his trips, I guess, or whatever they did, and he dropped dead in the driveway. He was 50 years old. What a sin. And in any event, so he used to go to the Jewish Center, and he bowled there. Now, I'm not a person who can say, I'm going to bowl every Tuesday night, I'm going to play cards every Thursday night. I can't do that. Okay, my, my work 
did not allow me to do that. My, my temperament just did not allow me to do that. But he influenced me, and I joined the Jewish Center, okay? Uh, it wasn't too long that it doesn't take too much to get involved. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I got involved, uh, and I was thinking before you came of the woman who called me to ask me to be the president. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm not that... Like was this, on, pro was this on Prospect Street yet? Pardon? Was this Prospect on Prospect Street? Street? Oh, sure, sure. And, uh, yeah, I, I got, uh, got an award, got all kinds of awards. I followed Leo Gold, uh, you know, as president. And uh, came to the time, well, we were fighting all this, but let me, let me back up, okay? Louis Lodstein was very influential in buying an Asilius property where the current Jewish Center now exists. Yes. Okay? <clears throat> he knew them. The old people had died. There was an estate. He had evidently knew them. And he influenced the estate to sell that property to the Jewish Center. And we bought that property. It was the big house that they lived in. So one of the things that I did was to convert that house into a facility, classrooms, activity, whatever. The, pr the I, present property? And the present property, right. I called it, we called it Newfield House, okay? Right. And... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the, the house was furnished, so before we could do anything, uh, we, had, we had a big auction. People came from all over the place. And I remember we raised some $35,000, okay? So that was enough seed money. What's to, that? What year was that? I, I can't... I, In the, the 60s? Early 60s? Pardon? Early 60s? I, no, I don't know. I don't know when the, I, I don't have the date for even when, the, in my head, I don't have the date for when the Jewish Center was uh, uh, built and dedicated. Uh, but it was maybe three years before that. Mm -hmm. If you knew that date, it was maybe two or three years before that. So, uh, anyway, we had this auction, and then I had, well, Herb Stoll, that's another person that I don't know, you know, he was around at the time. He ultimately moved to St. Croix in, where he had a house or whatever, but he was a contractor of sorts. And uh, he did the necessary alteration to suit our means. You know, you know, it wasn't an easy is issue because you're dealing with Young people would come, so you have to put in systems. You had to put in safety systems, fire alarm systems, and everything else. It wasn't just occupying the facility. But we made use of it, okay? And then it became pretty obvious that we got to move out of Prospect Street. People were mostly annoyed with the fact that there was no parking and they had to drop their children off. And there was this. It was a safety issue, so a security issue. So it became pretty obvious that we should plan on a new Jewish center. So I... I think that may have been about 1880, about no, 1981. Could be. No. Could be. I mean, you, you, not, not difficult to get the dates. Matter no. of fact, can I get up? Am I allowed? No. It's 79. This drawing is dated 79. So this is one of the you know, stack of plans, uh -huh. uh, which I gave them a long time ago. I yeah. had them, and I gave them to the uh, the archives. I gave them, yeah, to the historical side a long time ago. But anyway, so I'm dealing with '79 mm -hmm. was when this was done. Maybe took a year later. So you're about right, about '81. Yeah. You know, it was, uh, and. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I have, a, have a, another, you know, this was a brochure that we put out, a little flyer that we put out that showed the, the 
how we were selling this. We showed the layout. Anyway, uh, I was involved in up until the time that we retained an architect. And then my tenure was up. And uh, Gib Catton, I think, Gib Catton followed me. Right. And uh, he followed through. Al Kamhai became a construction person. Uh, oh, what's his name? Invaluable. Little person. What's his name? Wait a minute. Um. Sure. And um, I don't want to take away from Bert Hoffman, who was also involved. And there were there were enough people who were had the bits in there. Now, I had a very interesting experience because since I was in the construction business, I was really an an, an allied as a, in the electrical end of it. Anyway, uh, we had a couple of. We had a couple of mess ups, okay? I'm trying to be polite. <laughs> and uh, plans had to be redone and whatever. I mean, they did a terrible, terrible job when they initially put this out for bid. And then, uh, uh, but anyway, eventually we got a set of plans and it went out to bid. And Atlas Construction Company were the general contractors who bid who won the job. There were any number, DeLuca, I, I don't remember all the names, but generally the local people who were around here who were good builders at the time. Anyway, Atlas uh, won, uh, won the job. So I, now I'm not on a committee, I mean, I'm ex officio, okay? So I appear on the site during the construction period to look around and see what was going on. And I see things that I don't like. I mean, that, that as far as I remember from, I mean, I had gone through these drawings very, very distinctly. And uh, I didn't see them. So anyway, I was politely told to stay away from the job. <laughs> and that's what happens, okay? People uh, make decisions. Uh, I, I have to be blunt and say that usually they're people who have means, okay? And uh, whether or not they're thinking, they're thinking about the dollars, but they want to get the job done. And details are, don't mean anything, okay? So anyway, I, I was not involved at all in the construction of that facility. You see what it is today. I mean, it's a viable, you know. It's a viable well, institution. Right. So let me back up. Uh, at that time, too, when I was the president, I forgot his first name. His name was Goldberg. Went to Florida, and he never came back. Called up. He said he wasn't coming back. He was the uh, he was our director. Right? That's when we hired Saul Cohen. And Saul came from right here. And then he found a place and he brought his family up. And uh, he, did, he did okay. He, he went through he went through all of this construction and then had to deal with all of the people and everything else. And so he did okay. He did all right. The place isn't falling down. It's not gonna fall down. And uh, so that was it. I thought you were going to ask me way back, because I was very involved in synagogue construction. Milton Sanders and I were very involved. Not in this building. See, a lot of people think that I, you know, even Rabbi Ehrenkrantz thinks that I was involved in this building. It wasn't this building. It was another building. Tell me, tell us about that. Well, you know, the synagogue decided that they had to move out of uh, uh, Grove Street, and I think Louis Blatstein was again responsible for 
the uh, property that we are now it was occupied by the King School. Pardon? King School. King School. That's was occupied by the King School. I don't know somehow rather this and he was and. Um, once you get into a construction issue, I'm in there, okay? If I have, you know, I'm, I volunteer to do that. So we got involved and uh, Saul, Colin, Saul, sorry, Saul Young uh, and I became co-chairman of the building. We hired an architect. Actually, it was an uh, architect that Louis Lodstein, who, who had served him in, in his stores and other places, I suppose. And he was good, he was okay, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, the way we operated was to meet in Norwalk, just down the street from where Saw Young worked with Zell. Uh, there was a seafood restaurant doesn't exist anymore, burned down. And we would meet there and the, the uh, architect would come and he would give us an update on what the status was and so forth. Saul so really didn't want to get into a whole lot of details. Typical, just I, I said it earlier, okay? I'm, I'm not denigrating him, I'm just making a statement. Uh, that was not my style. So I said, first of all, the community has to know what's going on. So I got a set of plans. I opened an office in the school building. We sent out cards, more than once. Come and see the plans, give us your opinion. Then I brought some of my haverim up from New York, okay? People that, I, that are in I'm an electrical person. These people were in concrete and all kinds of other things, and they were there to be able to answer questions. I didn't get too many people, but we also didn't get too many. <laughs> we didn't get any complaints, okay? Because that's what typically, you know, what happens. You get uh, people begin to grouse about stuff because we didn't know anything about what was going on. You didn't tell us this thing. But anyway, that didn't happen. So we, now the structure, and there is a rendering somewhere. Maybe it's in the archives now, I don't know. I know it was in the stairwell. Underneath the stairwell that goes up to the sanctuary, there was a rendering of that building. And the building was, uh, could, could accommodate 1,700 people. It was a little, it was bigger than this. I mean, this now opens to that kind of thing. But, and then it had, a huge dome, glass dome. It was very, very old. That was the original red rendering? Oh, yeah. It had precast sides, not brick, because Rabbi Aaron Krantz did not want a brick building. He now has a brick building. <laughs> I can tell you that. Saul and I, we were irate one time when we had a meeting. We had a meeting at Todd Young's home out in Japan on a Sunday morning, and the rabbi made, uh, you know, two, I don't want a brick building. I don't want, uh, I, I want a private washroom, you know, with a lavatory. Uh, anyway, so I remember, uh, Sanders, Milton Sanders and I, we spent an inordinate amount of time, you couldn't believe it, uh, into the night visiting contractors, getting their opinions, getting, you know, re reworking the costs and everything else. Because the original building, we put it out to bid, and the bids came in way over our budget. So they abandoned it. So we had to go back to square one. That's I'm, I, I missed that point earlier. You know, we never built the original building. We built something else, and we built what you see now. 
And what you see now is a brick building and you know steel structure and whatever, which became cost effective. Okay, and that was we were able to do that. I think we burned the mortgage in 13 years. I mean, it was it was worked out you know, real well. I think it worked out well. Uh, following that, I became involved in the chapel construction. Milton Hollander was the chairman at that point. And we got into a little bit of a tangle here and there because of, again, details that he didn't want to know about, okay? You know, going to need temporary light and power. Where is that going to come from? Who's going to pay for that? Uh, you know, going to tap into the synagogue. You're going to get construction power, and it's going to run on, a, on the synagogue's meter. You know, where does the contractor pay for that? Okay, as an example, where where uh, are we going to let the workmen use the lavatories? Okay, and then who's going to clean them up because they're not going to be, you know, what's, what's the arrangement for porta johns? These are details, little details. They cost a few bucks here and there. Wouldn't hear about it. Okay, and, uh, made very very light about it because he wanted to keep the cost down. Mm. so that we could get the job done. I always praise, and I don't remember the architect's name, the architect who built the, you know, who designed that chapel and put it together. You know, when you look at it, it looks like one building. Yes. It's always remarkable to me, always. So I have had a, I've had some pretty good times, okay? And, uh, and they've always been rather interesting. I, I, uh, people, all the people, they're all dedicated, all of them, okay? They have, like in anything else, they have their points of view and, Everybody was and their backgrounds are important from where they come and, you You're also involved with the Jewish Historical Society in the library. Well, uh, Bobby Rosette is uh, responsible. Barbara Rosette? Barbara. Bobby, we call her Bobby. Yeah, we met Bobby Rosette many, many years ago when they first came to Stanford. Uh, they were friends, good friends of neighbors of Ruth's sister in Fairlawn, New Jersey. And uh, one thing led to another, and when I guess they heard that they were coming to Stanford, you know, look up my sister, you know, that kind of thing. And so we went to Buzz and Bobby way back, way, way back. And uh, I was not involved uh, in the creation of the uh, library. Joe Miller was was the lead, if you please. Uh, but Bobby was certainly part of that uh, initial committee and whatever that created the library. And I really don't recall, like, if I think hard enough, I guess I can maybe remember how it came up and I volunteered to be on the library committee. And then of course, when we read the library a little bit, I certainly got involved in that. And and now I'm the sleuth, I'm the super sleuth, I'm following up on uh, delinquent uh, on, the, on our delinquent library. I guess I, I, I think I have a modicum of, of uh, success uh, because I always leave my name, tell people to call me if they have a problem. And I do get phone calls and, oh yeah, I apologize, I have the book, I'm going to bring it back tomorrow. But then I'm also not very successful in a lot of other areas beyond my control. And uh, I'll continue to do that even though I'm going to have difficulty getting to uh, committee meetings, uh, I think. And I'm doing, I don't know, but I'm, I'm hoping doing another thing. Uh, I'm 
send, I'm sending the cards out for the book talks. Um, I didn't do it when I was away because I was away and then of course it was extended so and now I understand the January meeting has uh, got an, an issue so I'll probably get back to it in February and uh, uh, no problem. Bobby, Bobby brings me the cards and the, the labels and the stamps and not a problem. As a matter of fact, Bella and I sit there and we put it together in less than an hour. Uh, was there, we renovated the library at one time? I'm sorry. Did we renovate the library at one time? Well, it, it needed redoing. Yeah. Okay. Four years ago? Five years ago? I think five. Five. About five years ago. And, uh, so we got new shelves, and the first thing we did was put new lighting in. And then after that, uh, we got new shelves, and we got rid of every, all the old, most of the old cabinets. Uh, some are still there, I think. It's certainly the archive, the, uh, I'm sorry, the Holocaust cabinet is still there. Um, a lot of room. You know, tables, a couple of chairs to sit down and relax if you want to. I think, based on what Eileen, that's my lead, Eileen Rosner is my lead, when she sends me, I, I see a lot of activity, more activity in the library than I've seen in a long time. Now that's a little colored because when one person takes out 15 books and <laughs> takes up a lot of room on a page so but it seems to me that I see new names all the time and, and things happen things are happening a little by little people people from the time that I've been there have been phenomenal phenomenal I mean just uh, uh, in leadership in their leadership and their their volunteer effort and whatever. What else? Jack, I want to thank you for allowing us to come and interview you today. You didn't tell me. I got to tell you, I thought you were going to ask me because to me this is a very important part of my life. Okay. Okay. So I want to just tell you, I'm backing. I'm, I'm backtracking, way back, okay? I went to college, and, and I, I, t I already told you that uh, uh, the war started when I was uh, between my junior and senior year. If, I, if the war had not started, things were normal. I had joined the ROTC when I was already a freshman. So I was in the ROTC for four years that I was in college. If I, if the war was not on, I would have gone to engineers camp at Fort Belvoir, Virginia, uh, and for six weeks in the summertime. And then when I graduated, I would have graduated with second lieutenant bars. But the war was on, and all of these facilities were loaded, and they couldn't do that. So what happened was uh, uh, we graduated, but before I graduated, they shipped us out to Yapank, Irving Berlin's territory, uh, and uh, we were inducted as GIs, just the... Uh, privates in the service, okay? We had a great time out there. I, oh, my whole squad, whatever it was, we, come, we marched up and down the streets and because we had all this training, we had been doing this for, you know, over the years. And uh, we gave them a lot of shows. Uh, but we came back and graduated and I graduated in my, as a private, okay, mid-years, whatever. Parenthetically, in between my junior and senior year, 
we all went to work for companies, and I went to work for a company in New Jersey, and I you know, for the summer, I came back, and I finished my quote, whatever, it was a short year, okay, my senior year. After that, I had to go to OCS, the officer's training school, for 90 days, like all the other 90-day wonders, and then I got my second lieutenant bars. When I graduated, uh, for a very short time, they put me into a class for outside work, outside line work, telecommunication. Again, I'm, I'm skipping a number of things. We, we created, when, when I first started at the OC, at OCS, I'm sorry, when I first started at ROTC, uh, we only had, we had a, an artillery and a, an engineer division. Then, in my junior year, or just before that, we established a signal corps. And those of us who are in the electrical end of things, most of us joined the signal corps, whoever were, was in there. That's how I got to Fort Monmouth. And that's where I did my, my OCS and, and one thing or another. After this short spell for outside line work, I just waited. Accumulated a bunch of people waiting for orders to ship somewhere in the world because we were fighting on two fronts. We didn't have any idea where we were going. Eventually, we got an order. And the order was to get on a train and we headed west. So, uh, but I'm without going into all, all the other details, I ended up in Brisbane, Australia, and uh, Southwest Pacific Theater, and I was assigned to General MacArthur's headquarters as a signal center officer, which meant that I did an eight-hour shift around the clock, uh, very, there were, there were several of us, and of course, we um, in line with the Jewish aspect of all of this, I got there, it was, oh, not too much before uh, Pesach. So I wondered, you know, what do I do for Pesach? I called the chaplain's office. He said, you show up on Elizabeth Street, and we'll take care of things. So sure enough, air of Pesach, first night of Seder night, Sure, it was the first night, but early. I get to Elizabeth Street, the synagogue is there, and there are hundreds, hundreds of military people from England, from, from uh, Indonesia, from the Dutch, Dutch people, the Army, Navy, Air Force, I mean, all kinds of shapes. Now, they had started this program earlier, so many of these people were assigned to families. So they read off names and people went to their families. But then they had a residue, and I was part of that residue. And we, the, the Jewish welfare, <laughs> that was another, probably another reason why I became so, um, involved in the Jewish Center, okay, because it was the parent of the JCC. Anyway, they call it Jewish Welfare, or they cut the welfare out not too long ago. And uh, they brought the wine, they brought the tickets to the rabbi, uh, around the chapel, the rabbi and the chapel around the service, and uh, there were dozens, I have photographs of all of this somewhere in my basement. <clears throat> the next day I go to shul. Okay, next day was Yantan, so I went to shul. I, I had the day off. I, I didn't have the shift in any event, so I went to shul. So I'm sitting there, and the next thing you know, Chaplain Chomsky comes to me, what are you doing for lunch? I said, I know, I'm going back to my billet. I said, you know, I don't he said, no, you're going to come with me. So we went to the Newfield family home. 
and I went to their home every Friday night. Certainly holidays, whatever, okay? For and, and of course it wasn't only me, but there were any other any others. A lot of a lot of not a lot, but quite a few came down from the war. I was not in the war, I was not in combat from combat, okay? And some of these people were emaciated and you know, and they had a meal that was a big thing for them. So I was there until um, the war ended. I just missed going to, uh, I was assigned, a, I was ordered, I was given orders to go up to Darwin, Australia. You have to know the map, which is way up on the top of with a group, with a, with a platoon that had everything, including cooks and everything else. And we were to establish a base there and this was pre the invasion of Japan. Now there's a lot of stuff that I got involved in that I don't talk about, okay? A lot of uh, highly classified uh, code work that, you know, I, I just still to this day, I just don't talk about, it, even though it's history and, you know, let them uncover it, you know, 50, 60 years later. But the war ended, so I never got there. But I, I was to establish communications with Lord Mountbatten, MacArthur or Mountbatten in the China, in the Burma Theater. It's interesting, but it never happened. Of course, we dropped the bomb, and once we dropped the bomb, the war ended. I was there for about a year. I still, I was still in the signal center for about a year. A lot of the GIs had gone home. Uh, by that time, we rehired some of the guys that stayed in Australia. They liked Australia. They stayed it. They some of them got married, so we hired, rehired them. Uh, we we had uh, it was less a uh, we we had less uh, code work. Most of it was pretty open between. We communicated between Washington and MacArthur's headquarters and the front at MacArthur's headquarters. That was that was a communication there, and uh, it was an okay experience. I mean, it was a regular experience. I made a lot of acquaintances, a lot of acquaintances, uh, a lot of Jewish acquaintances. The rabbi had uh, four daughters. I'm sure he wanted to latch one of them on to me. And I was not particularly interested. I used to walk home, I went to the rabbi's house, I used to walk home with him. Uh, Saul Cohen came from Charleston. And one of the rabbi's daughters married a naval officer who came from Charleston. And so you know, we had that when it first came up, it, uh, it, was, uh, it was just kind of interesting, small world. Went to the Yom Kippur services in uh, Sydney, okay? Took leave and I went to Sydney. I have to tell you this, I mean, I have to. So I go to Sydney and, and of course you know about uh, UFO, USO, I'm sorry. The USO had a big establishment big counters, they serve breakfast and whatever. All volunteers, women, volunteers. I sit down, this is Arab, uh, before Kalmyk night, it might have been that day, if I remember, it might have been the day before. I sit down at the counter and order breakfast. This woman comes and she serves me, she says, you're Jewish. <laughs> Don't ask me how she, I said, yeah, what are you doing for Yom Kippur? I said, I'm, I'm looking around, I you know, want to go to shul. Well, you're, gonna, you're coming to the great synagogue and you're gonna sit with my husband and my family. And that's exactly what happened. I, and I, again, it's just, a, it's just a small world, okay? So I, I get there and I see these men and these men look like my uncles. 
right? It looks like, you know, they all came from one tribe, and they all kind of looked the same. One thing led to another, and it turns out that their, grand, their parents were buried on Manhattan Cemetery, where, where my, at that time my grandparents were buried, okay? And everybody always um, marveled at their tombstones because they were elegant and one thing or another. So it was a small world, a very small world. I had a lot of experiences. I'm sorry, I, I mean, I could go on a lot of little details, but uh, I, that was an important part of my life, and uh, uh, because I learned a lot. I grew up, I was only a kid, and I got to understand that you're dealing in 1945, and I was born in 22, I'm 22, 23 years old, you know, was, and I had was responsible for GIs. I don't know, you're recording everything, but uh, if I go way back, if I go back beyond that, so I graduated OCS and I'm waiting, we're waiting for orders. And a GI comes to me, he says, it comes from Philadelphia, which was not very far away. He says, I have to go home. I need leave. Well, we were, you know, we, we had no leave. We were waiting for orders. There was none of that. He says, I gotta go home, he says, because if I go home, then there's a good chance we're gonna have a baby. My wife and I. What do I do? <laughs> because if he doesn't come back, I end up in a break, okay, for the rest of the war. You know. But anyway, I let him go home. And uh, he did come back. Subsequently, I don't know how it was, whether it was he or someone else that they were together, told me that they had had a baby. I met him, I mean, I heard all this ultimately when I got to Australia and these guys were all fighting up in, the, up in New Guinea and, and ultimately the invasion of the, of, uh, of the Philippines. So a lot of a lot of interesting experience, and here I am, a kid, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, and, and responsible for all this. But I went it. Again, Jack, we say we thank you, and we will and be giving you a, a CVD. DVD of your experiences, which I'm sure you'll enjoy, and they'll go into the archives. Thank you. I'll send it to my family in Alaska. Oh, they will love I'll it. Have somebody cut a couple of copies for yep. my daughters. And uh, I started to record, I tell you, uh, at the beginning of last year I had a little heart attack, a small heart attack. And then when I got through the hospital and rehab and I came home, I began to record my life from the beginning. Pretty much what we're doing here. Yeah. I don't know how far I got because there was interruptions. But I have tapes and so forth. Um, so I've always wanted to do that and leave it for the kids, for the children to be able to uh, accumulate. My, um, not only my son and my daughters, sophisticated, I suppose, I don't know, but my grandchildren, yeah. my grandson is so, so interested. You know that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. All set? Okay. Yeah, I know.